Good morning and welcome to episode 15 of Friending the Mirror. I'm author and professional speaker Don Shaw, and I'm happy to have you join us for, wow, halfway through, over halfway through the year. I'm really excited to have as my guest today, Dr. James Partridge, who founded an organization called Changing Faces. The name of today's episode is Facing Disfigurement with Confidence. Dr. Partridge is the founder of and chief executive of Changing Faces, the leading new cage. Okay, I, I should probably read my stuff before I actually try and read it on the air. <laughs> Dr. Partridge founded Changing Faces, a leading UK charity supporting and representing people with disfigurements. When he was 18, James was severely burned in a car fire that changed his face and his life forever. In 1990, Penguin published his book called Changing Faces, which is full of unique insights and experiences. The warm response to this publication led him to relinquish his life as a dairy farmer and found the charity that he calls Changing Faces in 1992 to pass on the lessons he's learned. So I'd like to give a huge and very grateful welcome to Dr. James Partridge. And I know it's be. evening where you are, but it's morning you're still here. Everyone. Thank you, time yeah. difference. It's, uh, it's certainly evening here. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, and I'm very glad to be with you. Well, thank you so much. So we know that at the ripe young age of 18 is when you had your very unfortunate car accident. Can you tell us a little bit about what your life was like before the accident? My life before the accident was extremely ordinary, um, quite privileged. I had a lot of um, good education, I had a fantastic family background. I was a very lucky guy in many ways. Uh, and I took my looks and my face absolutely for granted. Uh, and in fact, I traded on it, I think, uh, and on them. So this is, I was growing up in the 1950s and the 1960s. So you can perhaps imagine, perhaps you can, that this is very, very different time to today. Are you hearing me okay? Oh, yes, I am. Sorry, I always have to check my broadcast um, audio. Okay. Because every once in a while it happens that, even though I can hear you just brilliantly, uh, the people that are listening cannot. So I have to switch okay. headphones and make sure that all the technical stuff is working. Fine. So tell us about your accident. What happened? Well, I just passed my driving test and I thought I could drive anywhere at any time in any conditions and probably wasn't concentrating quite enough as I came up to a difficult bend in the road in mid Wales on a December evening. It was dark and wet and I turned the car. This is a Land Rover, um, a Jeep. I turned it over and it blew up. And suddenly from being an 18 year old with the world ahead of me, I was uh, whisked into a burns unit with 40% burns to my face and body. And suddenly in those few seconds, my life changed completely. So one of the things that I learned from reading your book or that really struck me was when you were in the hospital, you described uh, uh, you use this magnificent metaphor about a hospital mask, about how the change of your face was very much like the hospital staff wearing their masks. And it would be better for you to explain it than for me to explain it. Well, it was a weird thing because in those days, and indeed today too, um, Burns units don't have mirrors available to patients. 
Um, so for three, even four months, I lay there having my reconstructive burns treatment, lots of skin grafts, lots of operations, trying to cover 40% of my body. And people came to see me and I could see that they were shocked by my face. Uh, they didn't have to say anything. Um, and of course, what was peculiar was in those days, less so now, nurses, particularly nursed, nursed patients with masks on. They had masks that covered their nose and mouth and completely. And so I would be nursed by these often very imagined, I imagine, very beautiful nurses, but I couldn't tell what their faces looked like at all. All I could see was their eyes and, of course, their body language uh, as they treated me. And there was a sort of curious irony that I realized not too long into the treatment, without being able to verbalize it, I couldn't, I, you know, this is on reflection now, but at the time I realized that, hey, I could still flirt with these nurses without a face, without their face being visible to me at all, but just with eyes. And, and that was a really quite important discovery, I think, because I kind of started to realize, again, it wasn't something I articulated, I didn't intellectualize it, but I sort of started to realize that, hmm, that's an interesting phenomenon. Maybe, maybe the behavior of the person is a rather important part of owning their face, even if their face is behind the mask. So it was, a, it was an interesting moment, yeah. So um, when you were in the hospital, I, I know that the hospital staff was just lovely. You mentioned that in your book. But could you also um, talk about, like, what was your support system like? Your family, your friends? How did that go for you? So we're talking about 1970, 1971, 72. Um, we're in the beginning of a very major... Um, economic crisis in Britain with oil prices hiking OPEC you you probably weren't around in those days it was difficult times there was massive inflation people were going through some really difficult times um, so that just sets a context my my family was absolutely amazing in the support that they gave me and my mother came to visit me every single day I was in the hospital somehow for 10 minutes some days, other days for much longer than that. Um, and although in the early days my friends kind of dwindled off, once I was starting to re rehabilitate, starting to make new friends, they too came to visit and didn't leave me isolated. I also, I think one of the distinctive features of that era was that hospital stays were much longer much, much longer than they are today. Infection control was much worse. Um, we had to we had to be bandaged up for a long time to treat wounds and, and following up operations. And so actually, many of the patients in the wards and their families became part of the support system too. So it was a different era, but I, I think what, what I knew was that while everybody around me in that hospital was brilliant at helping me physically and functionally, uh, you know, start working my hands that were damaged, get my face into some sort of better, I don't know, better, uh, better shape. Psychologically and socially, they were in the dark. And my parents were in the dark, I was in the dark, none of us really knew, how the heck does this go from here? It was safe in the cocoon of the hospital, but everything else was trial and error, and an awful lot of trial, and, and rather too much error too. Yeah, I certainly understand that for sure. Um, so I'm.
Hang on a second. There we go. Sorry, yeah, go just, ahead. Um, I was desperately seeking some kind of guidance. I remember talking to one of the nurses and the doctors saying, look, if I wanted to learn to, to, to speak French or cook a, a, a delicate Indian meal, I can get a book and I can read how to do it and I can get some instruction and, and wait a second, there's nothing here. Where, where is the guidance? Um, and, and eventually I, I got to speak to my surgeon after five years of this and I said, look, you know, I, I have to go and try to be a citizen. I, I can't go on just being patient here. Um, and he said, well, you know, if you can if you can discover how to be a citizen and not a patient, please do write it up because we don't know how to do that. And that's the truth of it. That was 1975, and I, I haven't had any surgery since then. Uh, so that's uh, good, good law, 40 years. Hmm. 40 so, years this July. So you were saying you haven't had surgery in 40 years. Wow, no. I'm impressed. No. Yeah, actually, I was nine. I was nine in uh, 1975, so yeah, I was around. You were so. around. You, well, you, you remember that era, perhaps, was in some ways uh, culturally quite a, a permissive era. Um, and we certainly, if you saw some of the pictures of me in that time, long hair, um, extravagant clothes, um, you know, let it all hang out, and, and we did. Uh, and in a way, that was a very welcoming world for somebody with strange looks to, to go back into. But of course, it was also a world where actually I didn't think that I fitted and, and stigma was all around me too. Is that why you ran off and became a dairy farmer to kind of get away from everybody? Hey, now, wait a second. Where did you get that from? Um, no, the, the reality was that I, um, I got work as an academic health economist in the University of London um, from 76 to 79. And then I met my wife uh, and she was from Guernsey, which is a little island in the Channel Islands. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, but we went there and I started to love the island and we started to think about going and, and raising a family in Guernsey. Uh, and in the process decided that maybe we could start a business out there. Um, and, and we did. And, and so, you know, it was not a hiding away thing, I can assure you, it was right out front. And if you think dairy farming is, uh, is a doddle, forget it. It's, uh, I didn't say that. 24-7, <laughs> 365, it, it is heavy work. Uh, and it was great fun. And we, we had three lovely kids and they all talk again to us at home. And uh, so, you know, it was, it was a wonderful time. And so you mentioned you've gone into academics um, after you recovered from your burn injury. So yeah. how was that going into going to work, going to society? How were you viewed? Well, um, I think that's the toughest phase of my um, adjustment, if you want to call it adjustment. Seven years it probably took me to get to the point of kind of mastering how to deal with the thousands of different social situations that you're liable to find yourself in. So this is public transport, walking down a street, going to the pub, going shopping, um, going to a party, and then of course, getting work. And getting work is a serious challenge for anybody with a, a facial, condition. Um, in my case, again, we need to think about the era. Unemployment was very low, so there were lots of jobs on the market. And with hindsight, I did a really sensible thing. I got a master's degree. After my first degree, I took a master's degree in medical demography. And with hindsight, that gave me a specialism that was not very common. So I got, I got a job pretty quickly once I got the master's, and it was fantastic. 
it was fantastic to get that job because you know with job comes esteem and confidence and everything else okay Are you okay there yeah no that's great so um all right so you did you went out you got a job and that gave you confidence so tell me when did the how, when did the book come in oh the, the book, book came in faces. the book came in years and years later um so my accident was 1970 by by 1980 i was a dairy farmer in, in guernsey and in the middle of the 80s there were a number of major fires in britain i don't know if you remember them but one was on an oil rig in the in the north sea one was in a in a football stand at bradford city and the last one was at king's cross underground station in london that one and, I remember. and on this i had talked to a number of publishers in the early 80s about writing something about what i'd been through and you know some kind of lesson some guidance some manual or something like that Anyway, after the King's Cross fire, I finally got a woman at Favour and Favour to approach Penguin for me. And that was how it came about. And suddenly I was being, you know, invited to London and signing a contract for Penguin. My God, I had no idea that, you know, I would do that, let alone have it published. So that's how it came about, almost by accident. Um, but I had certainly intended to write something because I felt that I had not had any kind of proper help that I, I think and I believe was fundamentally needed. So how did that then evolve into the creation of the charity, Changing Faces? Uh, well, this is, a, this is a funny story too. I, I have to say when that book appeared on the shelves in London, I thought that's it. I, I passed it on. This is this is what I wanted to do. I've done my my bit, um, and they got me onto one of these um, TV shows. Penguin did, and there was a woman reviewing my book called Dr. Nicola Rumsey, and I I never heard of her and. She produced a book out of her bag, which was called The Social Psychology of Facial Appearance, and I'd never heard of it. And there were 30 pages of academic references in the back of it, and I'd not read one of them. But the crucial thing about that meeting was that she said, I'm so pleased you haven't read my book. <laughs> I'm so pleased because we have reached exactly the same conclusions from two totally discrete positions. And that was an enormously important moment. And she said, you know, I, I said, well, what are the conclusions? And she said, well, more or less what your book says, we've got to change public attitudes. We've got to get healthcare to uh, uh, recognize psychosocial concerns for people with disfigurements of any cause, from birth, from accident, cancer, whatever skin conditions and thirdly what you say about social skills being fundamental is absolutely right and i proved it so you know three great big great big conclusions that she'd reached and i'd reached and so then she said well so what are you going to do next and i said well um, i have to go and mother cows <laughs> and but 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 it started conversations she and i became you know, kind of academic partners. She became the, the kind of um, the oversight of my crazy ideas. Um, but also I was absolutely determined that what we created, if we're gonna create something called Changing Faces should be underpinned by evidence, objective evidence, not just because James Partridge says it, it's gonna work, that's garbage. What we have to do is to test whether these interventions, these ideas, actually do make any difference. Because if they don't, chuck them out. Let's get the better ones. So she was that test. We did a lot of, we raised a lot of money to start with, got a research team. And eventually after 10 years, she is now professor of appearance psychology 
and she's heading up a center for appearance research. So, you know, that's a really, really important thing. We're testing what helps and what doesn't help. Well, it sounds like I should get her on my show. Oh, <laughs> she's, she's got some stories, but she's also got some fantastic insights, not just about disfigurement, but about appearance across the whole spectrum. So she's looking at, you know, a whole range of, of issues, some of which are not dissimilar to the ones that you and I and our community faces, but a lot are very different indeed. So, yeah, interesting. So um, just so you know, the, um, the background, uh, your background gets kind of unbearable when you're not talking because the microphone is trying to pick up um, anything in the room when you're not speaking. So what I'm going to do is uh, just hit the mute button for you when I'm talking. And you know how to unmute yourself, correct? So when you start talking, you can do that. So we're not fighting over the mute button. Anyway, I don't want to distract okay. you. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to distract from things too much with that, but um, I just, just want to, for the sanity of my audience. Anyway, um, could you now then talk about, and you've addressed it a little bit, but tell us about the main focus of Changing Faces, what it does for people, what it does on a social level. Okay, well, I'm not going to go into huge detail here because it would take the duration, but. If, if I say that Changing Faces is about two things and expand on those a little bit, the two things that we have majored on ever since the beginning is what we call changing lives and changing minds. And the changing lives agenda is all about empowering, nurturing, supporting uh, in all sorts of ways, individuals, all ages with any kind of condition that affects their face or body and their families and the other side of the coin changing minds is all about trying to influence the culture and the public attitudes and the employment market and the media and the cinema scene and all of those aspects of the culture that affect our lives, including the legal uh, background in which we all live. Right. So that's it in a that's in in a nutshell. I could speak about both sides of the coin in a bit more detail if you'd like me to. Um. Well, one of the things I'd like to do first before we, because uh, there's certainly, I mean, it's a wonderful organization, and for anyone who is struggling or who who does need help with just even support uh, on an emotional level or psychological level contact them because they have a ton of resources on their website and even though for us in america or canada they're across the pond it's still going to provide a huge and materials I, and, it, and it's not just the support materials we have two teams of trained people that we have active in the UK. One, one is a group of people that we call Changing Faces Practitioners who are trained up to deliver our model of help. And our model of help is being proved la, 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 over the years. And effectively, it's psychosocial help um, that covers how do you deal with your feelings? How do you develop assertiveness? How do you find out more about what you're going through and so on? And the, the other team is what we call our skin camouflage advisors and they are they're all volunteers and there are about 200 of them across the uk and they help people particularly with birthmarks and skin conditions um, and scars to grow some confidence by learning some makeup skills to conceal when they want to their their scars or whatever it is and that is, again, a highly empowering uh, service. So it's not just the online stuff. We can help, you know, face to face and in groups and so on. So if you want to contact, there's a support line and you can just write and, and somebody will come back to you by email or whatever it is. I've, uh, I've posted the... Um... I've posted the website on the on a post-it. It's uh, 
www.changingfaces.org.uk. And go there. And I was wondering, James, those services that are available for people in the UK, can people outside of the United Kingdom take advantage of those as well? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, our problem is, of course, one of resource, of staffing and staff time. And we have 35 people on the team uh, across the whole of our work. And funding that lot is quite a, quite a challenge, particularly at this time. Um, so we're trying to raise over one and a half million pounds this year to keep it all going. The problem is, of course, that actually providing a service beyond the UK is extremely difficult in any meaningful way, which is why the online resources are so important, because if people can't get you know, immediate access, they go on a waiting list or whatever, they can at least read the self-help uh, materials that are on our website. Now, we do have a few organizations in the United States and in Canada. We have About Face in Canada. In the United States, we have a handful. I haven't found one that really um, is all, as all-encompassing as Changing Faces. Uh, but they are out there, and if you have a need, you can contact me, and I can tell you about the ones I do know about. Um, so I, I think they, they all do great work, and um, we have contacts with many of them over the years, and not just in America, but in other countries as well. Um, you know, in the longer run, we, we certainly want to be much more um, available and accessible and active internationally. Yeah, which would be fine with me. So before we go much deeper in anything else, uh, one of the areas uh, that I did want to discuss especially was the use of the term disfigurement or disfigured. As James knows, because we discussed this and know my platform, I am not in favor of using a term like disfigurement to describe people. Um, but I'd like to give James an opportunity to explain why Changing Faces continues to use the term. Okay, we know that, quote, disfigurement is a, is a contested word. And I guess our view and the reason why we continue to use it is, is twofold. One is that we are a... a, a an organization that uh, offers help and advice and represents uh, a, a people with an enormous number of different facial conditions. And I could go through some of them if you wish, but everything from congenital conditions all the way through to facial cancer, Bell's palsy, stroke, uh, psoriasis, eczema, acne, etc., etc. Now, we believe that we have to have some collective term for referring to all those, to the visual impact of all of those conditions, the visual impact. And we haven't yet come across a better term than disfigurement. That's not to say there isn't one out there, but we don't actually go with the idea of difference because we don't think that that's particularly descriptive of the cause that we are striving to bring out into the public domain. We believe that we should call what this is the visual impact of perfectly ordinary everyday conditions, what it is seen to be. It is called disfigurement. I don't think that's fair. I'd love to get rid of the word forever and ever. But right now, we're not quite there. So the second reason is that we have fought a campaign in Britain, which started in 1995, to have legal protection in, uh, introduced and enacted that will prevent employers, the media, and other people 
using prejudicial words or images or acting in a discriminatory way. And, the, and we were successful. We got people with, quote, severe disfigurements covered under the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995 and, and again in the Equality Act of 2010. And we had to have a term that described exactly the sort of people that we were talking about. Not people whose faces happen to be different because frankly every face is different to every other face. And so we have stuck our neck out, put our face on the line, whatever you want to say, and we have managed to get Parliament to enact and the law and the judges to protect people against prejudice because of their, quote, disfigurement, unquote. I wish there was another term, but until there is, I'm afraid that's, that's where we are standing at the moment. Um, I hope that explains a little bit uh, without being too contesting or <laughs> controversial. Well, so I just want to, now I, that is totally understandable. And I've actually read, there was a document on Changing Faces website that explained why the organization continued to use that term. And it made sense to me because even though I, I can be a very passionate, emphatic person, I also like to think that I'm an intelligent and reasonable person as well. Dawn, I'm My glad name is <laughs> I'm very delighted to hear that you read that and liked it. Uh, I should just say one other thing before you, you, you finish. We would never expect you or me or anybody else to say, uh, I have a disfigurement. Uh, but if you wish to, to associate yourself with other people who have all these other conditions, you might want to say, we all have disfigurements and we are fighting a cause which we would say we are promoting face equality that's what we're campaigning for like race equality we don't want uh, a bit like the n-word we would like the d word to be bin get it out of the word way we don't want any of those words but frankly we're not there yet so i'm sorry to interrupt you that's totally fine. I, want, I do kind of understand the logic of when, when a, a group uses a term, like when the black community uses the N-word, when they own it, when the gay community uses a derogatory term like fag, they own the term. And I, I think I understand that that was part of what you're getting at. The more you use it, the less impact it has. For me, I come at it from a point of view of more self-esteem issues for people to learn that they have a disfigurement or to think of themselves as being disfigured. I just think for people who have self-esteem issues as it is, and believe me, I used to work for the federal government, so I understand how hard it is to change anything government related. So trying to get a language changed in a government document and have it make sense, I can definitely see. Ultimately, however, I would like to see, that is one of my personal goals, I'd like to see the language change. But more importantly, I'd like to see society's attitude change, because that's what's going to change anything. And, and of course, we are absolutely with you on that. I would like, I am very worried about the impact of all these conditions and particularly the visual impact of them on people's self-esteem. We grow up in a culture which prizes, quote, good looks and denigrates not such good looks. That is a culture we need to change. And I, I'm not sure that we can do that change without being willing to stand up and say, we are of this group of not good looks <laughs> and we did. I prefer that. <laughs> well, not, not good looks. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there will be a challenge to that too. That's not a phrase yet, but who knows? But the most important thing for me is that we are starting to see a movement for what we call face equality. Because it is. I love that. I, I love the term. Campaigning for is something positive. 
I don't want to be against things. I want to be for things. And for face equality is what I think we should all be relishing and, and campaigning for. And that means, I mean, this week we have been hearing that one of our regulators here, press standards regulators, are going to issue some very strong guidance on what newspapers can say and the words they can use. And that's because we said in the era of face equality, we don't think that it's fair to have. So this is a fairness issue. This is an equality issue. And those are the words that I want to hang on to. And I'm, I don't, I, I totally understand what you're saying about disfigurement and self-esteem. I don't belittle that at all. But my view is that we should go forward to campaign together for that change. And that will make a difference to everyone in the future. Yeah, I love uh, the idea of changing faces, uh, changing faces, changing attitudes, because really that's what I'm all about. I'm an individual. I mean, there's a handful of individuals, there's a handful of organizations, but it's amazing what difference. I mean, look at the difference you made as an individual person by starting changing faces. So anyone, I anyone. Say, I have to say that when I wrote this book, and incidentally there's some language in this book written 25 years ago, that I would say, oh, horrible. Okay, so, you know, there's, a, there's another book, you know, hopefully there's a second book in me somewhere, but that won't use some of this language. This is archaic, some of this stuff. But I hope that the fact that I've, done something to start something will be taken forward and and you know it's not I'm sad to say in my lifetime it's not likely we're going to see face equality but you know you have to start somewhere and if we look at the race equality movements they started by people just saying this isn't fair this is not fair and let's do something about it and that's what I, I salute you and and all these other organizations that you referred to in North America did you know that in Taiwan, there is a, a, a face equality day every year in May? Yeah. Why isn't there one in the States? Why isn't there one in Britain? Well, you know, we, we need to make those sorts of things happen. Sounds good to me. So moving on a little bit, but not changing the subject by any means, you have a wife and a family. So how has that been? You have children. I don't know how old they are now. You can share that if you wish. How was it for them having a dad who's, I'm going to use the term, face is different? Because that's my term. Yeah, and I would use face is unusual, face is different. I, don't, I, I wouldn't use the, my face is disfigured very often, if ever. No, I might use funny. Um, it was obviously an, an extraordinary journey we all went on together. What my wife and I decided very, very early on was to give our children as much information as we could possibly get across to them about me and you know my funny face, so that they could tell others you know what they were, what their funny-looking dad was all about. Um, my children are no longer quite so much children. Um, there's there. Are, Two of them are in their 30s, and one of them is coming up to 30. So, and I have some grandchildren too. So, you know, yeah, I could hear them. <laughs> it's good fun. Yes, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, but it was a good journey, I think, for them, and and we're on it now with the grandchildren. So, um, as I as I think you will know, you know, we're all educators in every place we go to, and and they can be too, and they will be, I'm sure. I know that uh, my dad just came to my defense in public situations. Do your kids ever ever defend you? Oh, there have been instances, yes. Um, I think the most famous one is um, one of my daughters was standing in a classroom with somebody said, cool, look at that odd looking bloke or words to that effect. Um, and she, she looked at this girl and said, oh, hold on a second, that's my dad. <laughs> Quite a nice little, nice little turnaround. Uh, but no, there have been quite a lot of instances where protection has been very much the name of the game. 
So you are a very public figure, thank goodness. I know that you've gone and spoken to committees and to politicians and you get out and do a lot of that stuff. Do you ever have any trouble? Do anybody ever, do, do, do you have trouble with people taking you seriously? Do they heckle you? Any of that? Um, no. <laughs> I think I was, I've been very, very fortunate in learning how to convey arguments um, and doing so in a, a firm way when necessary, but being able to laugh at or with when necessary too. One of the, actually one of the great things that I think I did was teach. I don't know if you've ever done any teaching, but if you can get up in a classroom and teach even when you're not feeling very good, and teach and and learn and be willing to be wrong um, because you frequently are if you're a teacher um, and, and then to get up and say right well we're going to do the next class and here it is and get on with it um, I think that's a huge learning in teaching which I'm very very glad I, I had seven years of it um, so no I, let's not be complacent I'm not on my own in doing this there are a lot of people around me. We have some fantastic champions in Britain and around the world now growing who, who are going to you know, come and say and follow and be, be upfront about their experience. And, and it will be different to mine. And, and you know, we, we, we just, I think, I think there's a, a certain sense of being able to influence things now. We've got this onto the agenda. We can, we can push forward. I'm, I'm excited. So when you're out in public, and I believe that I've actually heard stories or seen a vlog or something that people out in public on the street, whatever, have made rude comments towards you. How do you handle those? Yeah, it, it happens. It happens. And I don't think it, you can ever expect it not to. I'm afraid to say it can happen to any of us at any time in any public place. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big comment, it can just be something as simple as when you get onto the bus and walk past somebody, they go, Ugh. Yeah. It's not fun. How do I deal with that? Generally, I, I walk on thinking, hmm, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes, guys. Um, but sometimes, depending on my mood and the situation, I will say, well, thank you very much. That was very helpful. So sarcasm is certainly part of my agenda. Sometimes I will be quite assertive. Um, I'd rather you didn't speak like that to me. Um, sometimes I've gone over to crowds of people and said, do you, do you mind? Do you realize that you're staring? You know, it is unpleasant. Um, some people... Uh, have called me names. I had one classic case outside uh, seeing Phantom of the Opera with my with my uh, wife and, and one of our children, and we came out onto the street and we were just chatting about you know what it was like, and and somebody in the crowd said, "Cool, look, there's a Phantom," <laughs> and everybody turned around and you know, I, I, what, you know, come on, we're in the 21st century, guys, not something out of the 19th and on that occasion i just went oh, you know, get on with it and and turned to my wife and we went off and so sometimes you have to be willing to walk away and feel strong and sometimes you have to confront and there aren't any magic answers and our website cont contains quite a lot of stuff i think the school playground is the most beastly vile place um, on the planet and I'm afraid to say I think that's where low self-esteem starts for quite a lot of kids and we need to root that out we need to stamp it out uh, and uh, we've got a very strong um, anti-bullying uh, campaign here in Britain which we are pushing right into the educational inspectorates uh, and so on so yeah every which way you can we need to change that kind of permission to be rude. It's no longer acceptable. And bystanders need to get up and say, this is not acceptable. I am not prepared to listen to that. Um, as they would if somebody was racist. 
uh, or half, they will in most places, in Britain anyway. Um, but, you know, these are difficult issues, uh, no magics. Yeah, that is one thing when I speak to schools and I do speak to kids in schools. And one of the things I emphasize is when you do witness somebody who's not being treated well or treated fairly, even if you don't jump in at that particular moment, uh, saying something kind to that person after that afterwards or reporting the incident, even better, something, do something. Because when people are made to feel that nobody cares, that is probably the most dangerous feeling, is when people feel alone. Um, I also want to take this time to invite questions, because we're going to be getting a little short on time here. Uh, we do have somebody, Kathy just wrote in, and it says, you know, thank you, Dr. Partridge, for taking the time. Uh, what, what do you say about, what you say about feelings is very much appreciated. Um, she talks about she's had in-depth therapy and counseling and so that she's been able to deal with it in that way um and then you know reiterates the idea that yeah society really does need to start taking steps so i just wanted to share what what kathy said because i think it, it's really important the type of impact that we're having and the type of health that's out there for people so i think it's incredibly important that people find out where to get help and then decide and are given help to decide what's for them because not everything not everybody wants what you know we can offer or needs what we can offer some of some of the issues related to this are very very complex and very profound uh, and it takes a lot of time and care and support to be able to come out the other side so yeah, absolutely, Kathy, you are so right. Thank you for for uh, sending us that note. That's really great. And I know that, um, like from my perspective, I made a choice a long time ago. I don't wear makeup. Not that makeup would have really helped much. I, with me, it's, I've always kind of figured, you know, what are people going to notice about me? They're not going to notice what kind of makeup I'm wearing or that type of thing. I mean, they're going to say, oh, look, you know, she's she's different. So, yeah, I just figured, you know, I'm one of those people that doing my hair and putting on a lot of makeup, it just takes too much time. I think you probably uh, are not just not putting on makeup. You have developed a range of other dare one say communication skills which enable you to make your impact without the need for the, the makeup and so I bet if I were to meet you you'd be right at me pretty quickly to say hey don't ignore this don't ignore me uh, take me seriously and I, I suspect just seeing you on screen um, you're doing that pretty damn well so uh, <laughs> And I suspect your husband says that too. Uh, so, you know, and your friends do and so on. So I think makeup is a very interesting phenomenon for women. I think it's a fascinating thing how, how it is, quote, used. And of course, men don't have too often that advantage or disadvantage. Well, I happen to be married to a wonderful man, but I will say that he is, Ian is very average. And so when we're out, it's always me that they're going to remember. We go to a restaurant and we're, we're regulars because we've been there twice, right? But yeah, I definitely, I use my appearance to my advantage. I am very memorable and I like it that way. Feel free. Um, my wife has an expression about uh, more people know Tom Fool than Tom Fool knows. And I, <laughs> I'm afraid it's absolutely right. <laughs> I don't know about the fool part, but maybe sometimes. Because unfortunately, when you make an impression, whether it's a good impression or a bad impression, it's still an impression, and they're not going to forget. And, and the key, of course, is not to um, um, be, what's the word? Um, um, I, I want to say, if, if you start pulling back, and become and, and do go into your shell 
as I am just a little bit right now. Um, actually, everybody finds you more difficult to communicate with. <laughs> and that is unquestionably one of those vital skills that we try to impart to people that contact us. If you take you the person, if you take the initiative, if you are proactive in your meetings, you will be amazed at how warm people are towards you. But if you are for even, you know, you might not feel very confident, but to give the impression of confidence gives you a huge advantage. And that's not easy to do, but that is su such a big part of getting through this social uh, encounter barrier. Yeah, this is, uh, this is James's book, by the way. So I hope that, uh, I mean, it's available through the organization and it's, it's a good read, even if you're somebody like me who has kind of figured it out. It, it is a good read. I still thoroughly enjoyed it. And I was really happy because we definitely, that is one of the points you really emphasized was it forces you to become more outgoing. Being different forces you to be, if you want to function in society. Um, I want to add one more thing before uh, I know that uh, we're getting short on time. But one Can of the I things just that, say one other absolutely, thing? Absolutely, please uh, do. Uh, and that is where face equality is so interesting because when you say we, you have to force, and yes, I think you're right, we have to take the initiative so often in social encounters. Possibly, if you think about it, we might have to make 80%, 90% of the effort in those first meetings. And in a world in which face equality was really truly in existence, it wouldn't be like that. It would be 50-50. People would not be phased by somebody whose face looks a bit funny, different, whatever the word is. They would have that natural gift or natural affinity or that natural sense of fairness that would treat us absolutely with no stigma, no stereotype, no assumption. And that is how I would like the world to be in the future. 50-50 face equality. Absolutely. And frankly, once people spend any time with somebody who's different, you know, they don't see it anymore. I could, I personally could not describe most of my friends to you. And I'm not talking about people who have differences. I'm talking about my friends who don't have physical differences. I might be able to give you a couple of characteristics, but honestly, I don't really notice. You want to be careful about this, Dawn, because <laughs> they'll, they'll start to think that you don't really have any memory of them. Actually, I'll bet you that in your mind's eye, you remember their face above all else. When you think about them, you think about their face. You might not think about it in detail, but you will see it, and you'll probably see it moving, not like a mugshot. It's a blah, 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 blah. it's a moving, wonderful thing. And, and that's, of course, the way everybody does. So mugshots, get, let's get rid of them. They, they're nonsense. I love the, uh, there was a video out in social media not too long ago, and it was people who had their faces sketched by a police art artist, uh, one who does, you know, witness descriptions, and he had a bunch of people describe themselves, and then he had other people who really didn't know them um, describe them, and it was amazing the difference, the, the ones by people, the ones by the outsiders who really didn't know the person, that person was not only more true to how they actually look, but much more positive as well. I think most people, uh, different facial difference or not, see themselves a little more critically. And and if if we can just come back, I think your whole thing is called face face befriending the mirror. Befriending the mirror. Friending the mirror is the webinar. Yes. Friending the mirror. It's an interesting concept because. Actually, of course, the mirror is a lie. The mirror is a lie for people with asymmetrical faces like you and me. And very few people go through the act of getting to know themselves in video 
on film, more so now because of social media, but not, all, not everybody likes what they see in the video, and let alone the mirror. And of course, they're quite shocked when they see themselves in the video, because, oh my God, that's not what I look like in the mirror. Well, the mirror's a lie, guys. So it's, I think we're in an era where faces are going to become um, treated in a different way. And I'd love to feel that the likes of Facebook, yes, changing faces and Facebook and face equality, come on, you know, it's not too difficult, right? Um, you know, there could be a, a serious campaign to just transform stuff. So before, I know we're getting really short on time. So before we go, I did want to, I asked all my guests, what, if you had one piece of advice, if you had one inspirational thing that you could tell people that could help them change their lives or ch start changing their attitude or become better, feel better about themselves, what is the one thing that you suggest to get them started? So are you talking about them as individuals? Yes, you probably are. And I think the, the thing that I would probably say is don't forget or do remember the power of eye contact. The power of eye contact with another human being is incredibly important. And if plastic surgeons and others could simply say to their patients, use your eyes, use your eyes to communicate with the world, I think an enormous number of people would benefit from that tiny little advice. Use your eyes and pass it on, of course, pass it on. So when you say plastic surgeons and, and doctors and whatnot saying that, are you suggesting that if more people used their eyes, they might not want or need more or plastic surgery to try to improve themselves? Uh, Dawn, I'm not making a judgment about what they want, what they need. That is for their own clinical judgment and their own personal wishes. All I'm saying is that most people who have disfigurements have a lot of hospital treatments of one sort or another and I wish that the medical teams we're involved with this training of medical teams they need to understand that to neglect the psychosocial is a is a major error it's actually ethically unacceptable you cannot treat somebody without dealing with the psychosocial as well as the bio. The biomedical and the psychosocial have to go together. And that little comment about eyes, you know, it's a simple little trick. Use eye contact. It's not difficult. Oh, but it's terribly difficult. No, it isn't. Just try it. Just try it when you go down the street the next time you're shopping. You'll see a change in the quality of your social relationships fairly quickly, I think. Well, I would like to thank you so much, so, so much for taking the time, because I know how valuable your time is. Because It's you're my pleasure, busy. I think you're doing a fantastic job. These are beautiful webinars, and you're asking beautiful questions. I hope this gets out into all those you know, byways and and and, and um, pathways of the of the planet. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. Well, the one thing the webinars because they're recorded, they go on to YouTube and out into the you know inter internet. And even if people are not watching it today or even tomorrow, they might watch it next month or next year. So the webinars have created an archive, which I hope will be a valuable resource for people who do want to deal with appearance-related issues or just learn more about them. So, James. Well done. well done, you. Well done, you. That's a really, <laughs> really, keep it going. I mean, for goodness sake, 15 in the year, why not do 45? Um, no, I'm, I'm not serious, but I, I take my hat off. Go with it. I must go, actually. So thank you so much for your invitation. I hope this, this has worked for you. 
And thank you so much, James. Okay. I really appreciate you having been on with me. And we'll be in touch, I'm sure. Absolutely. Take care. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye. Thank you. So that was Dr. James Partridge. It was such a delight to have him on. I will have, be having another webinar in two weeks on Tuesday, August 18th at 12 noon. So we're back to our regular time. And that's 3 p.m. Eastern time. My guest is going to be Jana Kunert. And Jana runs an organization called Nub Ability Athletics Foundation, which is basically a program designed to help kids who are missing limbs to be able to be active in sports and to learn more, to be more athletic. So I'm really excited to have her on to talk about her program. And as usual, before I sign off, I would like to remind everyone to not only be kind to others, and that was what Dr. Partridge was talking about, is kindness, kindness to others, but also don't forget to be kind to yourself. And I will see you soon. We are love. We are one. We are how we treat each other when the day is done. We are peace. We are poor. We are how we treat each other. Nothing more. We are how we treat each other. Nothing more. We are how we treat each other.